Hello everyone and welcome to the weird, scary and horrible parts of humanity. Today we are exploring the final member of the Bali 9 in alphabetical order, Myurin Sukumaran. Sukumaran was born on the 17th of April 1981 in London in the United Kingdom. He was the eldest of three children with a younger brother, Chintu, and a younger sister, Brinfa. His family were Hindus of Sri Lankan Tamil origin. He was the son of Sam and Raji Sukumaran. In 1985, when he was aged four, his family moved to Australia and they settled down in Auburn in the west of Sydney, New South Wales. He attended Homebush Boys High School, where he was known as Mayu. Fellow Bali Nine ringleader Andrew Chan also attended Homebush Boys High School, but they did not know each other while they were in high school as they were four years apart and associated with different groups. Throughout his schooling he was the victim of bullying and racism and it was only during his adolescence that he started making friends of Chinese and Vietnamese descent and began to feel accepted. He attended university but dropped out in the first year of his course. He then began working in the mailroom of Global American Investment Bank State Street Corporation and at the mailroom in the passport office in Sydney. Sukumaran began using drugs and became attracted to a luxury lifestyle but he simply could not afford on a mailroom salary, including an attraction for fast cars, nightclubs and instant rewards, which got him into drug smuggling after he met a university friend for dinner. In an interview with SBS's Dateline in 2010, he stated, Well basically, a friend of mine that I went to uni with asked me to come to dinner and asked me if I wanted to join a gang. I sort of laughed at that. I was never involved in this in high school. Yeah, I was like, yeah, I'll come to dinner. Sitting around dinner, they were talking about all this type of stuff. It was kind of funny to me. Like, they pay for dinner and the nightclub afterwards and stuff like that. So I was like, yeah, it's just the lifestyle. All the people that were living, you know, you want to be like those people. Get the girls like those people. And I was hoping to buy a car, hoping to start a business. Those are the sort of things like I don't see, like myself working in the mail room for the next 50 years of my life. I thought, no, I can't do this. Then you see all these people in nightclubs with nice BMWs and nice Mercedes, and there's always chicks there, and they were buying drinks for everyone. And you think, fuck. How do you do this on a mailroom salary? He also said in a News Limited interview that before he got arrested, he was never really good at anything and had zero skills or hobbies and no real direction in his life. Sukumaran met fellow Bali Nine co-leader Andrew Chan at a friend's party in 2002, and it was around this time that he became a drug smuggler. Around 2004, he also met fellow Bali Nine member Renee Lawrence. Chan and Sukumaran gave Lawrence $100 for an airfare deposit to Bali, Indonesia, before giving her $1,080 on the 9th of October 2004 to purchase an airline ticket to Bali. On the 16th of October 2004, Lawrence flew to Bali, Indonesia on a false passport, with Chan entering Bali on the same day on a different flight with his girlfriend Grace. Chan stayed at the Hard Rock Complex, while Lawrence stayed at the Istana Rama Hotel in Kuta. On the 22nd of October 2004, Sukumaran attached packages of heroin to the bodies of Lawrence and Chan and Lawrence's back. The two, together with Grace, boarded an Australian Airlines Boeing 767 bound for Sydney. They cleared customs in both Indonesia and Sydney and were met at Sydney Airport by a man who Lawrence identified as Jay. Lawrence was taken in a car with two other people called Jackie and Daniel, and she was given a pair of scissors. She cut the heroin packets free and handed them to Jay. Taken to Daniel's house, Lawrence then went home, and Chan told her to come over to his parents' house in Enfield, Sydney, later that day. He handed her an envelope with $10,000 cash, and she alleged that it was to keep her mouth shut, and she was told not to put it into the bank all at once and not to say anything to anyone about the drug smuggling operation. On the 5th of April 2005, Sukumaran met with Bali Nine members C. Yi Chen, Martin Stevens and Lawrence at the Formula One Hotel Enfield, which is now the Ibis Budget. It was there that Sukumaran stuffed drug smuggling tools including sealable plastic bags, medical tape, elastic waistbands and skin-tied bike shorts into the bags of Stevens and Lawrence. 
Lawrence claimed that she was given cash by Si Yi Chen with the money originally coming from Sukumaran, while Stevens claimed that during this meeting his life was threatened. On the 6th of April 2005, Sukumaran met with another drug trafficking group at the Stratfield Spanish Inn Motor Lounge, now the Town and Country Motel, and handed a prospective group of drug smugglers $3,000 for airline tickets to Bali. These individuals were not members of the Bali Nine, and who these people were or what happened to them is unknown. Upon arriving in Bali, exactly what Sukumaran did is unknown, however photographic evidence by Indonesian authorities shows him staying at the Hard Rock Hotel with Chan, with whom he spent a substantive amount of time. Indeed, Indonesian police speculated that Sukumaran was Chan's bodyguard, as they were always seen together. Chan had changed the original departure date of the 14th of April 2005, as he suspected that Australian and Indonesian police were aware of the drug smuggling operation, and ordered everyone to change hotel as a result. Matthew Norman, C. Yi Chen, Renee Lawrence and Martin Stevens all checked into the Adidama Hotel in Bali as a result on the 14th of April 2005. In reality, Chan did not know that Indonesian and Australian authorities were already onto the nine. The father of Scott Rush, Lee Rush, contacted the Australian Federal Police fearing that his son was travelling to Bali to commit a drug-related crime and received assurance from the Australian Federal Police that his son was under surveillance to dissuade him from going through with the crime and that he would not be able to board the flight to Bali. However, the AFP never contacted Rush directly and instead alerted Indonesian police that a crime was going to be committed two weeks before the arrests, with the AFP having launched an investigation approximately 10 weeks before the arrests of the Bali Nine. So in essence, regardless of what Chan did, the operation was doomed from when the Nine left Australia. On the 17th of April 2005, at Nukagarai International Airport in Denpasar, Stevens, Lorridge, Suzukaj and Rush were found to be carrying a combined 9.039 kilograms of heroin body packed, which they were attempting to export to Australia, with Andrew Chan arrested on board an Australian Airlines Boeing 767, bound for Sydney with three mobile phones and a boarding pass to Sydney. Indonesian authorities had enough information to link him to the drug smuggling operation even though no drugs were found in his possession. Sukumara knew what had gone down at Nukagarai International Airport and ordered the remaining members of the Bali Nine, Tan Duk Van Nguyen, Si Yi Chen and Matthew Norman to check into the Melasti Hotel in Kuta, informing them that the operation was to be aborted. Sukumara appeared to be friendly as they checked in while Chen paid the $64 for one night of the Melasti Hotel. The three checked in acting as tourists while Sukumara went to the Hard Rock Hotel to get his bags. This happened to be Sukumaran's 24th birthday and also his last day of freedom. 20 minutes after the remaining members of the Bali Nine checked into the Malusti Hotel, police knocked at the door of the room where the three were staying, with Norman opening the door. The group were in possession of 334 grams of heroin and bundles of wrapping paper, elastoplast tape and a set of scales indicating that they planned to transport drugs into Australia. Nguyen, Chen and Norman were immediately arrested, with Sukumara and arrested upon his return from the Hard Rock Hotel. Australian and Indonesian police did not know the identity of Sukumara and referred to him as a dark-skinned man. Australian media felt minimal sympathy towards Sukumaran and labelled him the kingpin of the operation as well as the enforcer, based on the fact that he had taken a couple of classes of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. However, while Indonesian police identified him as one of the main players in a major smuggling ring, in reality Sukumaran was far from the kingpin of the operation. In the words of barrister Sam Di Carlo, Sukumaran and Chan were low-level smugglers in a wide syndicate, and it's clear that the police never got the ring leaders. The person to collect the drugs at Sydney Airport went by Pinocchio on text messages between Chan and Sukumaran. However, even though members of the Bali Nine are still alive, the exact name of this person is unknown, as only Chan and Sukumaran knew the true name and refused to share it, knowing that their families would be killed. In February 2015, Fairfax Media revealed the mastermind of the operation without sharing their name for legal purposes, noting that the individual was living in Sydney and had won $5 million in lotto, leading him to step away from crime, with the individual having been subjected to previous police investigations into drug trafficking.
On the 27th of April 2005, Indonesian police shot and killed Nepalese citizen Singh Gale, a known major drug trafficker who was killed in his Jakarta home and believed to have been connected to the Bali Nine, with Australian Federal Police Commissioner Mick Kelly stating that Gale was directly linked to the Bali Nine. A further six men, aged between 19 and 25, were arrested and released on bail in Brisbane, Queensland on drug trafficking charges and believed to have been associated with the Bali Nine. One of them, Khan Fan Li, was sentenced to seven years in jail at Brisbane's Magistrates Court in 2008. On the 12th of February 2006, 25-year-old South Korean Do Kyung Lee was arrested at Brisbane Airport arriving from Seoul, South Korea and charged with drug trafficking and importation offences, appearing at the Brisbane Magistrates Court on the 13th of February 2006. In 2008, Lee was charged at Brisbane Magistrates Court along with Shaode Kao, age 21, Francis Vui Jun Lee, age 25, and Alice Yun Huswan Young for conspiracy to import prohibited goods into Australia and offering Mills $10,000 to import drugs into Australia, with Kao, Francis Lee, and Yang having travelled twice on drug runs to Bali in 2004. I could not find any details of the sentencing beyond the seven year sentencing of Lee, so if you have any details, I really would love to hear about them in the comments. Thai prostitute Cherry Likit Banakorn who bought the heroin to be trafficked by the Bali Nine from Thailand into Bali, met on the 8th of April 2005 with Chan in a Kuta hotel room and gave him a silver suitcase filled with brown packages containing the heroin. On the 18th of April, the day after the Nine were arrested, Banakan escaped Indonesia and, while arrested on the Thai-Malaysian border, she was set free and allowed to enter Thailand. Thai officials claimed that their Indonesian counterparts do not have adequate extradition documentation for Banakorn to be extradited to Indonesia. She is currently on the run and wanted by Interpol and is on the red list. However, according to Fairfax Media, Banakorn is likely to be only a minor player within the drug syndicate. Sukumaran's trial began at the Denpasar District Court on the 11th of October 2005 and by December 2005, tensions were building between members of the Bali Nine and Sukumaran and Chan. Lawyers acting for some members of the Bali Nine sought the support of the Australian Director of Public Prosecutions to intervene and lay charges for conspiracy to import drugs into Australia so that the Nine could be extradited and charged under Australian law. However, judges called for the Australian government not to intervene. During the trial of Shuzhukaj, Sukumaran refused to give testimony, stating, I am also on trial. During his trial, Sukumaran denied knowing Shuzhukaj and Rush or any knowledge of a heroin importation plan and claimed that he had amnesia, which led to an inability to remember events leading up to his arrest. He also denied signing police statements upon his arrest and when asked by judges to produce his signature, he signed his name in four different styles. He claimed that he met Nguyen on his Australian Airlines flight to Bali and went out drinking with Nguyen, Chen, Norman and Chan whilst in Bali, which led to him being associated with the trio. On the 24th of January 2006, prosecutors called for the death penalty to be handed down to Sukumaran and days later called for the same for Chan. Prosecutors told the Denpasar District Court that there was no reason to show any leniency towards Sukumaran because he had helped to organise the heroin smuggling operation and along with Chan had strapped heroin to the bodies of other members of the Bali Nine. On the 14th of February 2006, Sukumaran was found guilty of drug trafficking and was sentenced to death by firing squad, which was followed by cheers from anti-drug campaigners. Chan was sentenced to death shortly thereafter. Brought back to his cell at Kerbakan prison, Sukumaran lunged at photographers. On the 26th of April 2006, in an appeal to the Indonesian Supreme Court, his death sentence was upheld. Sukumaran appealed for his death sentence in September 2010 to be reduced to life imprisonment. On the 6th of July 2011, this was rejected by the Indonesian Supreme Court. 
While Indonesian President Susilio Bambang Yudhoyono had the power to grant clemency for Sukumaran, this did not come to fruition. However, the temporary saviour for Sukumaran was President Susilio Bambang Yudhoyono, who implemented a moratorium on capital punishment between 2008 and 2013. While in prison, Sukumaran taught English, computer classes, graphic design and philosophy classes to prisoners and also opened up a computer and art room at Kerbakan prison, becoming a prolific artist which gave him great solace as he was able to utilise his hidden talent which he had never really utilised outside of prison with a mini studio set up in his prison cell. He also designed the Kingpin clothing label and sold clothes as well as his artwork. He also undertook gardening while in the Supermax component of Kerbakan prison prison. Since his execution, numerous of the projects that he spearheaded in Kerbakan prison have been taken over by fellow Bali 9 member Matthew Norman. Sukumaran attempted to have a law course and accountancy course set up in Kerbakan prison, but this never came to fruition. Sukumaran also undertook an associate degree in fine arts at Curtin University in Perth, Western Australia. Australian artist Matthew Sleaf, who became a close confidant and friend with Sukumaran, ran workshops in Kerbakan Prison and called him the best student that he had ever seen. Additionally, he oversaw a group of 20 prisoners, some of whom were facing execution, and housed in the prison's maximum security wing. He assigned tasks to prisoners under him, liaised with guards, resolved disputes, oversaw modest penalties and made small repairs in the prison. Moreover, while in prison, he converted to Christianity. His grandfather passed away while he was in prison. In an interview in 2014, Nine News reporter Damien Ryan described Sukumaran as the gentle giant. Under the Indonesian constitution, President Yudhoyono was constitutionally barred from serving a third term, and in the 2014 Indonesian presidential election, Joko Widodo, under the Great Indonesia Coalition as part of the Indonesian Democratic Party of Struggle, won the election on the 9th of July 2014, with 53.15% of the vote. President Widodo vowed no mercy for drug traffickers and re-enacted capital punishment in Indonesia. By this stage, Sukumaran, who could no longer be interviewed from Kerabakan prison with the Indonesian government having banned interviews of the pair by the Australian media, noted that he felt let down by Australia. In a letter to News Limited journalist Cindy Wachner, who interviewed the pair for Channel 10's Meet the Press, Sukumaran wondered what would have happened if he was white with blonde hair and had blue eyes or was a megapin drug lord who could afford to pay millions. Throughout much of his trial and imprisonment, although interviewed by Channel 7, 9, 10 and SBS at different stages throughout his imprisonment, many thought that Sukumaran was a victim of racism in Australia, as more interest, particularly during his initial trial, was put on to white, young Anglo-Saxon Australian Scott Rush and Matthew Norman, with the Sydney Morning Herald noting following the execution of Chan and Sukumaran that if caught in Asia with drugs, don't be Asian, don't be male, and don't be ugly. On the 18th of January 2015, Brazilian citizen Marco Archo Cardoso Marguerra, Dutch citizen Ankiem Soe, Indonesian Rani Andriani, known as Melissa Aprila, Vietnamese citizen Tran Phi Bich Han, as well as Nigerians Daniel Enuemo and Namayona Dennis were executed for drug trafficking. By the way, we did a video on the execution of Soe and a video on the execution of Archer, so please don't forget to check those videos out. By this stage, the possibility of Sukumaran and Chan being executed seemed very realistic. In an interview with the ABC on the 24th of January 2015, Raji Sukumaran said that she was terrified that her son would be taken out and shot, and that she didn't know what to do. She stated, he's a good kid, he's done something stupid, he's made a mistake, he's apologised for that, and he's rehabilitated. She also noted that he was a normal child with family who love him, and she was so proud to be his mother. The Australian government knew that it was very realistic that Sukumaran and Chan would be executed, with then Foreign Minister Julie Bishop interviewed by Sky News Australia and deploring the pair possibly being executed and arguing that if the two Australians were executed, Australia would recall its ambassador to Indonesia. On the 12th of February 2015, Bishop spoke in the Australian House of Representatives, imploring for the lives of Chan and Sukumaran to be spared.
Then Prime Minister Tony Abbott made some rather bizarre statements, arguing that Indonesia should reciprocate Australia's aid to Indonesia following the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami by sparing the lives of Chan and Sukumaran, with Australia having given $1 billion of aid in response to this tsunami which devastated Southeast Asia on the 26th of December 2004, with 227,898 people left dead, of whom 130,700 136 died in Indonesia, in the AK region, and 500,000 were displaced. The statements by Prime Minister Abbott led Indonesian citizens to leave coins for Australia outside Australian embassies in Indonesia with the hashtag Coin Untuk Australia, translating to Coins for Australia, generating 65,000 mentions on Twitter in five days. A final attempt to avert the death penalty of Sukumaran occurred on the 9th of February 2015, when a legal challenge was raised against President Widodo's refusal to grant Sukumaran and Chan pardons, but this was rejected on the 10th of February 2015, sealing both men's fate. Throughout his final weeks, Sukumaran did numerous pieces of art against the death penalty. At 5.18am on the 3rd of March 2015, both Sukumaran and Chan were transferred from Kerbakan Prison to Nusa Kambangan Island on board a Lion Air ATR-72600 in preparation for their execution. Sukumaran packed his easel and painting materials and said goodbye to his friends in prison on the 2nd of March, knowing that he was going to be transferred. Both landed at Kilavap three hours later before being transferred by ferry to Nusa Kambangan Island. Sukumaran's mother was awaiting his arrival on the island with his family having travelled from Kerbakan prison. In his only interview, Bali 9 member Tanduk Fan Nguyen told the Daily Telegraph that his mother cried for days after hearing that the pair would be executed and stated that he was distraught for their loved ones and agonisingly certain that he would be next even though he wasn't on death row. On the 25th of April, Sukumaran's sister, Brinfa Sukumaran, appeared in a YouTube video clutching a framed photo of Sukumaran wearing his school uniform as a young boy and stated, My brother made a mistake 10 years ago and he's paid for the mistake every single day since then. My brother is now a good man and after 10 years in prison, he has taught so many Indonesian prisoners about art and about how to live outside in the world and have a good and productive life. From the bottom of my heart, please, President Widodo, have mercy on my brother. Change punishment for humanity. In the hours before his execution, Sukumaran painted vigorously, including pictures of a bleeding heart and the cross against which he would be executed, as well as a self-portrait 48 hours before he died, with the text, Time is Ticking, written on the back of the easel. His last picture resembled a bleeding Indonesian flag. On the 27th of April, he didn't sleep as he painted all night. On the same day, his family visited him for one final time, with his family reiterating for mercy from the Widodo government in front of the media, reiterating their hope that he would be saved. His mother asked for him to pray, but could see that he had given up. Sukumaran read Genesis, Exodus, the Book of Micah, and Psalm 121 in the Bible. His last meal were boxes of KFC. In a 2017 interview with news.com.au, friend and artist Ben Quilty said that Sukumaran wasn't furious over his fate, but was angry about the treatment of others set to face the firing squad, as they were unaware of what was going on while accepting his fate. Quilty had met Sukumaran three years before his execution, with Sukumaran having written a letter to Quilty asking him about his painting technique. In a letter that he wrote to Quilty, which arrived months after Sukumaran's execution, Sukumaran noted that even though his execution was unfair, he had accepted his fate, and he was not scared to die. Pastor Christy Buckingham from Melbourne was the last to see Sukumaran and Chan alive, who noted that they sang and prayed in their final moments and ate chocolate. His last words to Buckingham were, Do me a favour. Ask the question in a year's time. Has this made a difference? Has it made any difference in Indonesia? Has it made any difference to the way Australians feel about the death penalty? Ask the question in one year, in five years, and in ten years. Ask it to yourself. Ask it to those around you. And ask it to anyone who will listen. Has this made a difference either way? Has this made a difference?
On the 29th of April 2015, in the early morning hours, Sukumaran was executed by firing squad along with Chan, Nigerians Okawudili, Oyatanze, Martin Anderson, Rahim Agbadje Salame, Sylvester Obikwe Norlise, Brazilian Rodrigo Gulate, and Indonesian citizen Zainal Abedin. By the way, we did a video on the execution of Gulate, so don't forget to check that video out. They all refused to be blindfolded and sang Amazing Grace and 10,000 Reasons Bless the Lord before being shot by the 12 member firing squad. However, in accordance with Indonesian law, only three members of the firing squad had real bullets, while the rest had fake bullets, so they would not know who had fired the lethal shots. The eight coffins were taken on a ferry from Nusa Kambangan Island to Kilakap Port, where they were met by family members before being flown to Jakarta. Amnesty International condemned the execution and vigils were held across Australia. The execution led to responses by countless celebrities and politicians against the executions and death penalty, with statements released by Sam Neill, Russell Brand, Sir Richard Branson, Annabel Crabb, Bill Shorten, Guy Pearce, Anthony Albanese and David Campbell. Sukumaran's body and his family returned to Sydney on Saturday the 2nd of May 2015 on board Qantas Flight 42, which arrived from Jakarta into Sydney at 6.13am, more than 10 years since he had last been in Australia. On the 8th of May, Sukumaran's mother wrote a letter to President Widodo stating, I watched as over the last four months you tortured him by making jokes about his life, making him guess the night he would be taken, openly discussing the way in which he would die, parading and humiliating our family. Your reasons for taking these lives had nothing to do with preventing drugs and everything to do with your politics. Sukumaran's funeral was conducted at Dayspring Church in Castle Hill in Sydney, New South Wales on the 9th of May 2015 with 1,200 people attending. In an interview with the ABC 7.30 in January 2017, his mother noted that her faith was shocked by her son's execution. The executions of Chan and Sukumaran were debatably the low point of Australia and Indonesia's relationship, with Australia's ambassador to Indonesia, Paul Grigson, recalled from Indonesia for five weeks before returning to Jakarta on the 11th of June 2015. However, particularly under Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, Australia's relationship was rebuilt with Indonesia following the executions of Chan and Sukumaran, and despite warnings of consequences, these turned out to be half-hearted at best by the Australian government. Prime Minister Turnbull travelled to Indonesia in November 2015 to rebuild the relationship between both countries. In the same month, Sukumaran's family posthumously accepted the GQ Artist of the Year award on his behalf. In 2018, Wachner wrote the book, The Pastor and the Painter, Inside the Lives of Andrew Chan and Mayo and Sukumaran, from Aussie schoolboys to Bali 9 drug traffickers to Kerbakan's redeemed men. In January 2017, Sukumaran's first major art exhibition called Another Day in Paradise was held at the Campbelltown Arts Centre in New South Wales, which was curated by artist and friend of Sukumaran, Ben Quilty. During the exhibition, his mother, Raji Sukumaran, said that she wanted her son to be remembered through his art. In 2018, his exhibition was featured at the Tugranong Arts Centre in Canberra, the capital of Australia. In the same year, the movie Guilty was released and screened on ABC2, with the movie analysing the final 72 hours of Sukumaran's life. The movie won the Australian Teachers of Media Award for Best Documentary and the Australian Cinematographers Society Victoria and Tasmania Gold Award for Dramatised Documentary in 2019 and was nominated for the Australian Directors Guild Best Direction in a Documentary Feature. Thank you for watching, please do yourself a favour and hit that subscribe button and the bell icon to inform yourself of when new videos come out. Also why not hit that like button and leave a nice comment, it means more than you know and your support is truly appreciated. Until next time, stay awesome, stay classy, be kind to everyone you meet, have an amazing day and remember that truth is always more interesting than fiction.